Good evening. Can I have your attention, please? Thank you. First of all, welcome all of you at another uh, lecture uh, dedicated to uh, the American elections uh, organized by the Studium Generale, which I presume most of you are more or less familiar with. Uh, we organize uh, a large amount of lectures, debates, and other events uh, for the, well, the academic population and the Groningers. Um, my name is Pieter Swieringa. I, uh, I work at the Globalization Studies Groningen um, that you may have heard of, which is a university-wide uh, research institute. And I do some programming for, um, for Studium Generale. Um, tonight's lecture is a part of a series on um, issues that pervade American society at large that we think have uh, a defining role uh, to play on the American elections. So instead of focusing on current affairs, affairs we would like to look beyond uh, what is happening today or tonight, the presidential debate of course, um, and we would like to see what other aspects influence um, this society. So we've been looking at media. The Daily Show has been uh, uh, the first lecture. And on October 30, which you can already note in your agendas, in your organizers, we'll have a lecture on, on the, uh, the power politics of the US. Is this a hegemonic power? Or are they uh, guarding the freedom in the world? Um, this will be a lecture by Rob Cruz. I'll mention it again uh, afterwards. Um, our guests for tonight are the Reverend uh, Sam van Leer, who is not Dutch, uh, even though his name suggests otherwise, and um, Erwin Wilson. And they will, um, they will discuss how religion influences uh, society and politics. Um, Aaron Wilson is the director of the Center for um, uh, Religion, Conflict, and the Public Domain, uh, which is a newly established institute um, at the Faculty of Theology and Religion Studies. And her research focuses on the role of religion in political uh, rhetoric. So that uh, works very well for this evening. Um, our other guest, Sam Valier, the Reverend Sam Valier, um, works for the pastoral team. Yes, we have a pastoral team here um, uh, at the University of Groningen. And um, he's the assistant chaplain for the Anglican Church here in Groningen. And um, he studied comparative politics. So um, they'll, um, they'll give us a presentation of about an hour. And after the, that hour, we have about half an hour uh, for questions and remarks. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to ask you to turn off your cell phone, please. And please be aware that there is no break. Thank you. I've never worn one of these things before. It's slightly off-putting. I don't know if you have. But, um, Sam and I are going to tag team the lecture tonight. As you've just heard, Sam's got a background in comparative politics. My background is international relations. So we're both going to speak to this question of the place of religion in US presidential politics from these different perspectives. So Sam's going to be focusing particularly on population demographics and the religious and political movements within the United States and how that has historically and in the contemporary context affected presidential campaigning and the role of the president. I'm going to be looking a little bit more at the narratives and the, the myths, the stories that get told about the United States as a nation, the, the, how religion features in the national identity of the US and then how that plays out in the way the role of the president is perceived and also how that, that language and that, that imagery and those ways of thinking affects the way presidents talk and also impacts on their policies and particularly the ways in which they justify their policies. So Sam is going to start off, so I'll hand it over to him. Thank you. Am I audible, more or less? Thank you. OK, now we're going to see if this works, the uh, technology bit. Um, I wanted to begin with a comparison uh, of the situation in the United States uh, with this country simply because uh, it may or may not surprise you, but it's, it's interesting to begin. Whoops, that was not what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay. 
First of all, um, America is a fairly religious country, at least that's the perception, isn't it? Um, moi. Yes, interesting. Well, the discussion will be interesting later on. Um, on the top, you see from the General Social Survey of 2008, uh, the regularity of worship attendance in the United States. Um, and basically, the top part of the pie is uh, people who attend uh, at least once a month. Yeah? And about 33% attend once a week, at least. That's fairly often. Um, at the bottom, you see also from the General Social Survey 2008, uh, the distribution of uh, affiliation uh, with religion in the United States. And you see um, the bottom, the, the dark color here, 50% nearly Protestant Christian. And 25% Roman Catholic. And this is 2008, 16.3%. Uh, well, the, the little slice at the top is 1.8% Jewish. 16.3% um, uh, none. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean doesn't believe. That's what I think might include what's become popular to call here eatsism. There's something out there, but you don't identify with a particular church or other uh, organization. Um, Incidentally, there's been a poll done in the, last, in the first part of 2012 that's indicated that the, the, the nun, the people who don't affiliate with a particular organization, um, has risen to 20%. So perhaps an element of uh, some degree of secularization, at least in people's choices of belonging. Okay. Now, compare that with Europe. Um, <clears throat> what we see... If you remember, it was, this is a monthly comparison, um, the European Union social state. So it's really only the southern part of Europe, plus Ireland, that compares. Um, actually, you see Poland, uh, this is 75% you know, uh, on a monthly basis. Don't know what the exact figures are on a weekly basis, but uh, you'll notice Orthodox and Roman Catholic uh, countries um, with a habit of church attendance with some regularity. And then you go down from there, really. And you see the Netherlands is about one in five once a month. Yeah? So there's a sharp contrast, and we might be asking ourselves, why? But that's not the only thing. Um, America is strange. Because on the one hand, the uh, First Amendment of the Constitution... Um, ratified in 1791, when they decided that they needed a Bill of Rights, um, was that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So there will be no established church or other religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It's been an interesting balance. Congress is not allowed to endorse a religion, but Congress is also not allowed to prevent religion from developing. So, there's an assumption that there's this sharp separation between church and state. But, on the other hand, if you look on our coins and our bills of currency, you see things like, in God we trust. Now, how on earth is that possible? And, in 1955, President Dwight Eisenhower said, he felt this was a basic principle of Americanism, Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. The American way of life is founded in faith. Interesting paradox. A, church, uh, a state that's not allowed to endorse religion, and yet, on its coins, in God we trust. And presidents, well, saying God bless you at the end of their speeches. At least we now know from, from the 1970s onward. Well, we can trace it back to uh, the colonial period. had a nice discussion um, about lineage uh, uh, because I presented he, his family also went to America. My family, uh, originally from Europe, uh, fled to, uh, to the colonies. Um, 
We know that there was a Protestant minister some time three, four hundred years ago who uh, moved from Switzerland to North uh, Germany and across the Netherlands. Um, and what happened was a lot, of, uh, a lot of European dissidents who didn't agree with the religions of the states that they lived in um, decided to move to the New World and seek uh, religious freedom there. Um, this had a twofold advantage. Um, it allowed the home countries to get rid of people that were causing problems, and it allowed the people, as they moved to a new place, to exercise their faith freely. What we have is an interesting distribution of religion across the original uh, colonies. I have the English colonies in red on the east coast there. And um, the part of New England, the uppermost part of red, was, was occupied by staunch Puritans. Congregationalist, although there were exceptions, fascinatingly. Um, there were dissenters to the dissenters. Um, so you have people like Roger Will Williams, who didn't quite like how things were working out in Massachusetts, founding his own colony in Rhode Island. He disagreed that church and state should go together at this time, before the Constitution in the 17th century. He felt that civil and religious spheres must be kept separate. Faith is personal. So he didn't want to go in with the state religion of Puritanism in Massachusetts and moved to Rhode Island. Pennsylvania had a fair number of Quakers under William Penn. Uh, Maryland, colony um, uh, around the middle there, um, was founded for Catholics. And there were lots of Lutherans, um, Jews, and Dutch Reformed uh, in New Amsterdam, which later became New York. And the middle colonies to the south, <coughs> Uh, sorry, that was the middle college, the, the southern bit. Uh, so from some, if you can see, Virginia onwards, uh, downwards, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, primarily Anglicans or Church of England people and split offs from Anglicanism, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians. We'll, we'll hear more of the first two groups, Baptist and Methodist, because they became extremely influential in the development of Protestant religion in the United States. But let's not forget that um, the dissenters were allowed to move to uh, North America to exercise their religion, but at the same time, uh, there were economic interests um, of the uh, colonial powers. People were animated by the notion of having freedom. Freedom not only to worship as they wish, but also to build their own businesses, to have their own farms, and one of the animating philosophies um, was that of John Locke, with which um, you're familiar probably. He suggested that everyone has a natural right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. Now, when I say that, most Americans go, huh? Because in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson changed the wording to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But property's always been important. <laughs> Locke felt that you had the right to take property and claim property from nature by working it. This was a fine idea for people in a new country, lots of land to seize. The problem was is that uh, the Native Americans who already occupied the land, um, well, they didn't work the land in the same way. So many people felt they didn't deserve to stay on the land. And eventually, uh, this became one of the darkest aspects of American history uh, under people like Andrew Jackson driving the uh, Native Americans off the land on the East Coast and out to reservations in the West. The English economic interest, for one, in the East Coast colonies was very strong. You had the uh, treasurer of the uh, English government um, early on in the colonial period being approached by a uh, philanthropic-minded uh, pastor from Virginia who wanted to found what later became the College of William and Mary. He said, please, our uh, people in America need to be educated. Uh, they need to improve uh, their souls through education and understanding the Bible. The response from the treasurer was, souls, damn their souls, make tobacco. Economic motivation has always been important. Um, 
I mentioned, first of all, the First Amendment uh, and the separation of church and state in that amendment. Um, all of this is, that was in 1791, the adoption of the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the US Constitution. But um, before that happened, the real precedent for the idea of the separation of church and state in American history came in Virginia, in the colony of Virginia, and a debate between Thomas Jefferson, later the third president, James Madison, later the fourth president, and Patrick Henry, who was a great orator. And Patrick Henry felt that really there ought to be a tax to raise money to support the churches in Virginia. Madison and Jefferson disagreed, though. Um, and in fact, Madison reckoned that uh, religious freedom would fail if you subsidized churches. And he said that religion, as an engine of social policy, is tyranny. And he reckoned that this proposal that Patrick Henry had to subsidize churches was the first step in a career of intolerance, he called it. And the last step was something like the Spanish Inquisition. So the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which Thomas Jefferson wrote, was passed on the notion that no man should be compelled to support or frequent a place of worship to be forced to be involved in uh, any religious opinions or beliefs, that they should be free to profess whatever they like and maintain those arguments if they wished. So the idea was to keep the state out of religion, not because these people were not religious, but they thought that once you mix the state with religion, actually religion loses. That was the precedent, which was adopted at a and later after the Constitutional Convention. One of the fascinating things about the Constitutional Convention after the War of Independence was that religion wasn't mentioned. I think it was partly because people feared letting it in. Instead, as you might expect from what I just said, property, law, trade, natural rights featured, but God is not to be found in the text of the American Constitution. Interestingly enough, one representative from Connecticut tried to change the preamble of the U.S. Constitution to add something along the lines of, we all acknowledge a supreme being who blesses us with liberty. That wasn't accepted. And Benjamin Franklin suggested during a particularly difficult time in the debate that we needed prayer and that maybe they needed to call in a chaplain. That was rejected. Madison and others opinions prevailed. They were afraid of any particular religious faction getting the upper hand in U.S. politics. So they maintained the separation, which eventually, in the First Amendment, of the federal constitution was cemented. Ah, but that's just the federal constitution. What about the states? The states were actually permitted to maintain state churches. And some of them did. Um, some Baptists in Connecticut were irritated that they were being left, um, that they were being disadvantaged by the Presbyterian Church, which is a state church in Connecticut. And um, they wrote Thomas Jefferson during his uh, term in 1801. Actually, they wrote in 1800, no, 1801, and he replied on the 1st of January, 1802 that he felt that there was indeed a wall of separation between church and state. Unfortunately, he didn't help out the Baptists because he didn't say it applied to the states. So they were disappointed, even though he argued on their behalf. In the end, the Constitution separated church and state, but didn't keep religion out of politics. Didn't keep religion out of politics. What one early Pennsylvania evangelical pastor said is that actually church and state are separate, but they're mutual friends in the American tradition. Church and state didn't, religion didn't stay out of politics. Fascinating, just an early taste of the, uh, how religion could enter the political fray in the 1800 um, election. You had John Adams, who was the vice president under George Washington, a member of the Federalist Party. He was a, uh, a good uh, Massachusetts uh, Congregationalist, Calvinist, and Thomas Jefferson, who was the Democratic Republican, 
in favor of states' rights, not a large federal government. But um, both of them were fairly religious moderates. But some of the political supporters of Adams seized upon the fact that um, Jefferson's views about religion were a bit strange, they thought. He, um, his official description as a Unitarian, he wasn't so sure about uh, the Trinitarian nature of God. Um, his uh, biblical understanding was that um, he wasn't so sure about all of the miracles of Jesus. He did respect Jesus as a moral teacher. But the supporters of Adams, not Adams himself, uh, seized upon it to cast Jefferson as an atheist uh, supporter of French uh, revolution. Adams was cast as a dogmatic Calvinist. But later letters that they shared showed that they regretted this, both of them, what happened in the campaign, that religion was used against each of them in the campaign, which incidentally Jefferson won, which is interesting. Uh, Jefferson later wrote to a friend that uh, I am a Christian and the only sense that really matters. I'm attached to Jesus' doctrines and prefer them above all others. But he was regarded with some suspicion. Adams later said, <clears throat> when he was asked to go on the post-presidential sort of speaking tour, um, to talk about things like religion and politics, he rejected it. He didn't want to do that because to talk about religion and politics as an ex-president, he thought, would be hypocritical. People would think I was trying to establish the church, and as a Presbyterian, I'd just as soon establish the Episcopal or the Catholic Church. My opinions on religious subjects ought not to be of any consequence to anyone but myself. Early assessments of the religious marketplace. I suggested that there was an established church in places like Connecticut, also certainly in Massachusetts. Initially, the support that the church tax that they had in Connecticut was called the Standing Order, but in 1818, the state of Connecticut followed the federal government in its separation of church and state, and one Presbyterian pastor there said, this is the darkest day in Connecticut's history. <clears throat> but within about 10 years, he came around to the idea because he saw the motivation of the church leaders and the people who belong to churches for evangelization, and he saw church growth. Later, he said, actually, it was the best thing that ever happened to Connecticut. And in 1833, Massachusetts was the last state of the states then in the Union to disestablish a church. So from then on, there was a complete separation of church and state officially in the United States. Perhaps you've heard of Alexis de Tocqueville, most famous early assessment of the state of, uh, well, society of the United States, but he had comments as well on religion and politics in the United States when he had come back from his tour of uh, the uh, North American continent funded by the King of France. He'd actually been sent over to um, investigate the prison system, but came back with a lot more. And he said, the first thing that struck him on my arrival was the religious atmosphere of the place. The sects which exist in the United States are innumerable. Religion in America takes no direct part in government of society, but it must nevertheless be regarded as the foremost of the political institutions of that country. Ironic. It does not impart, for if it does not impart a taste for freedom, it facilitates the use of free institutions. Tocqueville is arguing that religion aids democracy in the exercise of civil liberties. We don't have the freedom of religion and protection of freedom of religion and voluntarism in religion and other uh, middle level groups in society, then there's no chance for democracy to survive. All the people he agreed said that, uh, all the people with which he spoke said that the main reason for the quiet sway of religion over their country was the complete separation of church and state. Any alliance with any political power is bound to be burdensome for religion. 
interesting. The concern was for the prosperity of religion, not so much the state. Yet, he observed, as I suggested, was ingrained with John Locke and Adam Smith's thinking, he was concerned about too much economic thinking early on in America and, in particular, individualistic materialism. And he saw that there was an inordinate love of material gratification in 1831 already. Not only do Americans follow their religion out of self-interest, but they often place in this world the interest one can have in following it. Yikes. I did want to address before I stop um, some of the aspects of what I think are distinctly American um, in religion, given the overview that uh, it was primarily Protestant from the foundations, and some of this um, was reinforced and galvanized by what was called the Great Awakening in 1730 to 1750, a, a revival. It was an ecum ecumenical effort. Presbyterians, Anglicans, Congregationalists working together. Um, preachers going on the road. Charismatic preaching. Emotional reactions. Personal conversion. George Whitfield, the Anglican, referred to it as new birth. It comes back with people like Jimmy Carter in the presidency as born again. And I noted it was ecumenical. It was the first ecumenical movement. And some historians think that working together in the mid-18th century trained Americans to work together for the eventual fight against the English. There was a second Great Awakening from, the 1800, from 1800 onward. And what was fascinating about this one, briefly, is that similar to the elements in the first one, but also choice became a central theological element. It was charismatic, emotional, personal, but the aspect of choice that you could be saved and choose to be saved, it's actually quite radical from a, an orthodox uh, Calvinist perspective. If you know Jacobus Arminius in Leiden and the big dispute that was resolved at the Synod of Dort here in this country, uh, the people who believed that we were saved by God's almighty acts without so much choice on our own part, actually prevailed in this country. Um, but in the United States, that came over as well. But also uh, Methodism with the Wesley brothers um, and the view that actually individual choice matters in our salvation as well. Not just what God does, but what we do too. And that was actually, that became a fundamental aspect, I think, of, of American Protestant understanding, and it features later on, this choice. You can be saved by choice as well, by God's work, but by choice. And if you fall, you can be saved again. Um, personal sanctification through social reforms could be achieved, sparked the abolition of slavery movement, temperance movements, and the civil rights movements we'll come back to later on. One thing Charles Finney introduced is that you can actually inspire people to change their hearts. So these are all elements of how evangelicalism, which became profoundly influential in the United States, works. I'm going to pass over this because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but it's fascinating. I'll come back to it in the... Uh, I've covered that as well. Um, um, just to point up an interesting feature, um, these last two slides... Um, in American uh, church affiliation development. Here's some sociologists who did an attempt to figure out how many people associated with churches in American history from 1776 onward. And what's fascinating is, despite the view that, oh, well, yes, the founding fathers were all firm uh, uh, and loyal Christian uh, people, perhaps many of the founding fathers were, but... In the early stages, the colonies, churches weren't so organized, so not many people belonged to lots of them, and perhaps the records weren't so good. But we have here 15% in 1776. But you see, as one could argue, the free market of religion opens up, and there's more competition and motivation, more, and people, more people are belonging to churches. And it's a continuing trend. It's fascinating, actually, it's fascinating to me that actually also in the Netherlands, um, 
there was actually an, uh, an increase in church membership up until uh, the 70s or 80s. You can see here the Roman Catholic is the top of the lower lines, and sorry, the bottom of the lower lines, the Protestant. Have I got it wrong? No, I've got it. No, that's, no, that's true. That's true. It's Protestant on the bottom and Roman Catholic on the top. So you have almost uh, 8 million out of 10 million in 1947 belonging to churches in the Netherlands. Yeah? But you see the population trend going up and the church affiliation trend going down. What's distinctive about the United States is that it seems to be gradually increasing. It may be leveling out, but it doesn't seem to be dropping dramatically, as seems to be the case in the Netherlands. Okay. <laughs> Tag, you're it. <laughs> okay. Um, before we move on to looking at the contemporary events and particularly what we're all interested in, which is the current presidential election, um, I just want to talk about, the, take stock of some of this stuff and put it in the context of some of the broader themes that are emerging about the United States, about what, what it is as a nation, what its purpose is, what its destiny is. Even this idea of a nation having a destiny, having a purpose, is really important in the context of the US. Um, but not just the US. I think it's important to, to make that point. Lots of nations have sacred elements within their national identity and they have sacred rituals as part of their public politics. But for some reason, whether it's because it's particularly obvious in the United States or whether it's because we just have this kind of fascination with, with the US because it's one of, if not the, most powerful nations in the world, um, we just, it, it just boggles the mind in a sense. And Sam's already pointed out how we have this, this real conundrum that there is, on one hand, separation of church and state, and yet, on the other, this incredibly religious nation where religion plays such a powerful role in how the nation thinks about itself and how its president is supposed to present themselves and how they're supposed to act and talk. Um, so... But one of the, th the other things to keep in mind... so. The religious themes are, are particularly affiliated with the Judeo-Christian tradition, but the importance of religion in the US context is also to do with this emphasis on religion, religious freedom, which Sam has already talked about. So it's not just about religion being particularly important. And this, to put it into academic speak, is termed to be Judeo-Christian or passive secularism. Um, and so, and that's Judeo-Christian secularism is a term talked about by Elizabeth Shackman Hurd, if you're interested. Uh, and passive secularism is from Ahmed Kuru. Judeo-Christian secularism doesn't attempt to expel religion, or at least not the Judeo-Christian religion, from public life, but requires that the state play a passive role in avoiding establishment of religions, allowing for the public visibility of religion. On the other hand, les cités which is also Hurd's term, or assertive secularism, Kuru's term, actively advocates the total exclusion of religion from the public sphere. And the obvious examples here are Turkey and France. So Judeo-Christian secularism in the United States is facilitated by some founding myths. Um, and one such myth is this idea of the new world being an example to the old world of religious freedom and tolerance. Related to that idea is that the United States was destined to be a city on a hill. And this comes from a, a speech, a, a sermon given by Jonathan Winthrop called uh, a, a Model of Christian Charity. And he's speaking to the... There's speculation that he actually gave this sermon on a boat on the way over to the New, the new World, the colonies. And he's talking about the importance of showing that showing, demonstrating mercy, demonstrating justice to the people, to, to the old world. And he uses this phrase, a city on a hill. And if you're familiar with your Bible, I don't know how many of you are, um, but Jesus talks about the importance of Christian followers being a city on a hill. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works 
and give glory to your Father in heaven. And this idea of the city on a hill recurs throughout US history, and, and particularly in US presidential politics. Both Kennedy and Reagan in the contemporary period made use of this phrase. And so calling a nation a city on a hill has quite significant religious connotations. It's, a, it's a, supposed to be some kind of an example to the rest of the world so that they will see God, so that they will praise God, so that they will follow the example of that nation. Um, and the other theme which, uh, which Sam also mentioned is, is the, the doctrine of manifest destiny, which was particularly important in the 19th century. Um, and it was the, the driving idea behind much 19th century expansionism, that the United States had a special calling, a special destiny to, to expand and to take over the, the American continent um, to, and inha inhabit the entire continent, which was used to justify all kinds of genocide and also colonial wars. Um, and a lot, some people have also seen the emergence of this doctrine as an interpretation of America as God's new Israel, coming in and, and taking over the promised land, claiming the promised land. But this idea owes much to international politics as well. Um, in international politics, Manifest Destiny... Um, it meant that the United States was in some way better than other nations within the international system. It doesn't... The phrase manifest destiny rarely gets used in, in contemporary politics today, but it is still an underlying theme, in a sense, that the United States has this special purpose, this special calling, and as such it has significant responsibilities within the global political sphere. So then... How do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of this, this relationship, this, this apparent conundrum? And Robert Bella has proposed the idea of American civil religion. And he, he argues that it's this civil religion that allows us to reconcile the separation of church and state with this tremendous influence of religion on US national identity. Um, and so... He's argued that there are three elements to American civil religion. The first is religious rituals and memorials, national days of remembrance, prayer services, presidential inaugurations, and I would add State of the Union addresses. Um, the second element is a body of sacred national documents, such as the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, um, the Pledge of Allegiance, which interestingly only came out in the 1950s, was only written and, and implemented in the 1950s. Um, so this idea that they somehow form the sacred scriptures of the nation, in, in a sense. And then the third element that he talks about is the casting of significant figures in US history, particularly presidents, but not only presidents, as prophets and martyrs for the nation. And you can see here, there's a, it's, it's called a memorial ribbon for Abraham Lincoln when he was assassinated. And it says, we mourn a martyred father. So... Arguably, presidents, you, uh, you could also make the argument that presidents are, in some sense, a high priest of the American civil religion. And that that, in some way, affects why presidents seem to have to talk about their religion, why they're held to a higher moral standard, why this plays such a significant role in presidential campaigns, because they have this, this added symbolic element as part of the American civil religion. But, as Anthony Smith has pointed out, it's not just in the United States. It may be particularly obvious in the United States, but there are other examples as well. Excuse me. Um, if you think about Israel is another example. Or, I don't... Forgive me, I'm from Australia. I've only been here about eight months, so I'm not terribly familiar with Dutch culture. But in, the, in an Australian context, we, have, we, we refer to the Anzacs. They're a particularly important figure in our, in our national history. So it's not necessarily a person that we, that we talk about as being a martyr for the nation or making a, the ultimate sacrifice for the nation. Uh, but it's a group of people who paid that price. And you can't but help notice the similarity with the figure of Christ. Jesus paid the ultimate price for reconciling humanity to God. Here... 
presidents, on occasion, pay the ultimate price for bringing the nation together, for serving their country. It, the same thing happens with soldiers. It, they, they get talked about in this, in this quite sacred, almost religious way. So these are some of the key themes that recur in the US national identity and also in presidential rhetoric. Um, the US and sometimes the president themselves as a Christ-like figure, this idea of a special purpose and a special calling that carries with it greater expectations and greater responsibilities, the city on a hill, a leader or an example for the rest of the world to follow, and the presidents and priests, presidents as priests and prophets of the nation, meaning that they're held to a higher standard. Now, the important thing about this is that these themes recur over and over again. They get reinforced but it's not just for the purposes of pretty sounding rhetoric or to inspire people. They also form a framework through which policies get developed, get presented and get justified. Certain policy options get opened up through the use of this rhetoric and others get closed off. So it's actually quite an important political tool. And I'm going to look quickly at a couple of global events that have had an impact on how this, this language is used. And the first I want to look at is Franklin Roosevelt, um, who, which I found out today is actually a Dutch surname. So <laughs> field, it, originally it was Van Roosevelt, uh, Field of Roses. Um, so well, FDR was president during two quite critical moments in US history. This is the, the other important point, is that crisis moments in US politics, but also in global politics, are particularly significant for this articulation of the identity of America, and for when these religious themes get brought back in, in particular. So we were talking before about this phrase, God bless America. The first president to use it was Richard Nixon when he was trying to deal with the Watergate scandal. <laughs> So crisis moments become really critical points for presidents to draw on this, this, this bank, if you like, of shared cultural assumptions, shared understanding, things that when you're embedded within a culture, you don't even necessarily see yourself. And we have... This isn't just the United States where this happens. There's a whole range of assumptions that, that we have that come from long historical what Johann Galtung calls deep culture, and they're so deeply embedded in the subconscious of a civilization, of a community, that they're completely unrecognized as being for what they are. But they are these quite clever, subtle ways of interpreting the world and responding to it in a particular way. But if you shift the way that you think about it, it also shifts the way that you respond. Anyway, so... FDR, two crises during his presidency. The first was the Great Depression and the second was World War II. I'm going to focus on World War II purely in the interest of time. Um, the United States emerged as a truly global power during and after World War II. So it's quite a critical moment for them. Um, and also, if you look at Roosevelt's language during this period, it's very, it's very black and white. It's very us and them good and evil, it's this kind of Manichean rhetoric about, and it, and it ties into these ideas of what Mark Jürgensmeyer calls cosmic war, in which it's cast as a battle between God and Satan, between good and evil, and there's no room for compromise. And this is just some excerpts from his 1942 State of the Union, which was just a month after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which is quite significant to keep in mind. Um, so he talks about not just the material centres, but the spiritual centres of civilization. And I haven't included it there, but he goes on to list a series of countries, so he includes the Netherlands, actually, um, as, as being the spiritual and material centres, and he says, towards the ultimate goal of the destruction of the United States. So... The United States is, is the... That, that immediately says the United States is the holdout. It's the, the one that's protecting the rest of civilization from this, this catastrophe. Um, and then... Just this sentence here is particularly significant. The world is too small to provide adequate living room for both Hitler and God. 
So what he does there, it's not, it's not explicit, but it, it may as well be. Essentially, Hitler is Satan, or at least on the side of Satan. And again, doesn't say it, but the United States and all of their allies are on the side of God. And FDR isn't the only president to use this kind of rhetoric. In more recent history, George W. Bush made quite significant use of it. If we have time, I'll get under, onto that as well. This was another interesting thing in that speech. We must not under, underrate the enemy. He is powerful and cunning. He will stop at nothing that gives him a chance to kill and to destroy. There's no reference for that, but he's almost quoting scripture there. Because in John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance. Again, it's this very subtle sort of, the United States is on the side of God. Okay, uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to... Skip, well, I'll just stop on this one example. Mm -hmm. As the priest of the nation, so JFK, this is a few examples from JFK. Um, if you think about it, I don't know if you've been to a religious service, but if you go to a religious service, right at the end, there's this call to you know, go out and serve God with all your gifts, and, and the, the, the priest usually prays over the congregation. It's almost like the president does the exact same thing at the end of his speeches. <coughs> With thanks to Almighty God for seeing us through a perilous passage, we ask his help anew in guiding the Good Ship Union. That's like a prayer. And other presidents do the same thing, not just with God Bless America. You see it in, in other ways as well, which, again, I'll get onto in a sec. Really quick point. This country cannot afford to be materially rich and spiritually poor. It's, it's very small. It's a very small reference. But that one reference sort of casts all of these things that he talks about here. And this is where he outlines his key policy implements, key policies that he's going to implement, domestic policy, that have to strengthen the spiritual life of the nation. Now, whether that's... And, and putting that in the context of all of these other themes that are out there on American national identity, you then you kind of make this link as to what he's, what he's getting at. And one of the critical points that he was talking about here, under third, we need to strengthen our nation by protecting the basic rights of his citizens, was the civil rights of African Americans. And Sam's going to talk a little bit about that now. Okay. Just a little. <laughs> Quickly. Um, because I, I suggested earlier on, as I've been following sort of the undercurrents of, of, of church development and, and religious beliefs um, that, that influence the sort of upper level rhetoric of, of the leadership in the country, um, I, I talked about the, the movements um, and of uh, the development of what is characteristically American approach to, to religious life, particularly a Protestant uh, evangelical uh, understanding of things. And it might have come across that, well, also taking Tocqueville's words, that the Americans are really only interested in private salvation. But that wouldn't be a fair assessment, um, because uh, throughout the uh, 19th century, uh, there were those who were calling for social reform um, on a religious, uh, motivated by religion and, and the gospel to, to bring social reform to society, concern for uh, po uh, people in poverty, and also in slavery. Um, if uh, the ethnic cleansing of Native Americans from the eastern United States was one of the dark moments in American history, then certainly slavery was the other big one. There might be a list of others as well. Um, but what's remarkable is that religion was also part of the solution of uh, the slavery situation in the abolition movement, and also as we reached into uh, the post-war period, um, the civil rights movement as well. Um, one might have thought it was ironic that uh, Christians could tolerate something like slavery um, for several hundred years. Uh, many historians have observed that as an irony. Um, but the fact of the matter, unfortunately, was that religion um, was divided um, particularly biblical interpretation of the question of slavery. 
um, there are certainly Old Testament and New Testament um, examples of uh, the Bible, if not condoning slavery, at least accepting it as the norm, which was, well, taken up by southern, uh, uh, the southern cause uh, in the Civil War to justify slavery, and they, they considered it their own sacred cause to be different. Two nations under God, thank you. Um, at the same time, though, um, among the African slaves, um, there was a growth in uh, Christianity, not surprisingly um, more uh, in, in a de development in the Baptist tradition and the Methodist tradition. Why? Because these churches were organized locally and by lay people often. So they didn't have to have the master of the plantation in charge. From early on, these churches and congregations were segregated. Uh, it's unfortunate to say that segregation, even though it's been banned from public schools in the United States, is still very much a fact of life in American churches. Very few are mixed, with the exception of one of the slides I showed a while back um, that we passed over of the Pentecostal movement in Los Angeles, which in the early uh, 20th century included blacks and whites. Um, but uh, the, the religious scene was fairly segregated. And W.B. Du Bois, that's how he pronounced it, a sociologist, first African-American PhD from Harvard, um, described the, what he called Negro religion as featuring three things, the preacher, the music, and the frenzy. Part of the charismatic leader, the music, the spirituals that are still sung in churches, both black and white today, and the sort of charismatic excitement when it came to the civil rights movement, it was very much a Christian initiative of black church leadership. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, started by Martin Luther King um, and uh, Abernathy and Jesse Jackson and others. They believed in nonviolence. They used biblical imagery, the liberation of the Israelites from Egypt. They also appealed to the American civil religion that Aaron was referring to, the most famous speech that uh, we associate with, uh, with uh, Martin Luther King. He gave on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963, and he makes a blatant appeal to this understanding of the civil religion. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. It's not just a statement. It's a creed, he says. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So... Here are a bunch of Christian uh, minority leaders making an appeal to the white population to be better Americans and better Christians. And if they hadn't made it that way, it's unclear whether it would have worked because they appealed to something that all Americans could identify with, this civil religion and also with a, a biblical Christian element to it. Interestingly enough, the consequences of the marches and the protests um, was that, yes, there were successes. Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas in 1954 declared that separate schools, white schools, black schools, are not equal, overturning the 1896 court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, that allowed separate but equal. And then the Civil Rights Act that banished um, segregation in other areas of life, including employment and service at restaurants and so forth and busing, and the Voting Rights Act that uh, sought to overcome uh, other obstacles to allowing African Americans and other minorities to vote. There were, however, reactions in the Ku Klux Klan and also the Nation of Islam. You see a, a picture of Malcolm X there who believed that actually Christianity was a slave religion. It came off of the plantations and so it need, we need to turn our backs on it as African Americans. And uh, there were also progressives in the National Council of Churches that um, favored the movement of, of uh, desegregation. Ironically, the civil rights movement ultimately reduced, resulted in a weakne weakening of the black churches in the United States. Funnily enough, you could say the same about the rise of the welfare state in Western Europe because hospitals and other forms of charity were originally Christian innovations which were taken over by the state. And so now Christians do less, you could say. 
but uh, the churches as training grounds for Christian leaders among minorities um, de- were depleted. And also there was a transformation, yes, sorry, yes, there was a transformation of segregation, white flight from the cities, now that they were no longer segregated, and realignment of the political parties. Um, the rise of the religious right comes next, but, uh, yeah, time? <laughs> we'll come back to it in the question and answer. Um, I'm going to skip over most of this as well and get right to the final discussion. Again, we can just see these examples of US presidents as priests of the nation. And again, this unacknowledged quotation of scripture here, we finished the race, we kept them free, we kept the faith. I have fought the good fight, I have run the race, I have kept the faith. And here he refers to the sacred flame of liberty, this last best hope of man on earth. That's how the Bible describes Jesus as well. So, yeah, you could make your own inferences there. Um, George Bush Sr., um, president at, during the, 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 the end of the Cold War. Um, again, these ideas of him... Th- this one is... is quite interesting the way he talks about the end of the Cold War. There are singular moments in history, dates that divide all that goes before from all that comes after. That's pretty much how we think about the birth of Jesus as well. But history can be read in multiple ways. George W. Bush, yeah, he's really a little bit too obvious. He probably... (laughs) He's, um, yeah... I, had, I actually had this photo that I took out, but it's this, this great photo of, of him in a, an, an army observation point looking through a pair of binoculars. That have still got the covers on them. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, so he makes use of this. Um, again, this, one, this was just... It's amazing how often presidents quote scripture. It's really quite astonishing. If you look at the way that that sentence is constructed... It almost mirrors this verse from Isaiah, which is also quoted by Jesus. It's this really subtle kind of implicit way of casting the nation as this Christ-like messianic figure in the global political sphere. Axis of evil, yeah, you know, we've all heard it. Um, He also makes use of words like parasites, their, their madness and their hatred to talk about the terrorists, which is similar to what um, FDR did with the, with the Nazis in relation to World War II, casting them, it's satanising them almost, in a sense, so that you can then justify a whole range of policy options against them. If they're not truly human, then torture is OK. Um, stop for a sec on Obama, because... He's, current, he's the current president, um, who knows how, for how much longer. He's been the president during the worst financial crisis since the 1930s and with it, for the entire globe. So he's had quite a bit that's affected him as a president and affected his presidency. He's, he also takes on this role of president of the na- priest of the nation, sorry, where... You know, he, he talks about the need for the people to rally themselves. We don't quit. I don't quit. You know, and then blesses them as they go out. Um, a future full of hope. Our onward journey together. So just in the last few minutes, we'll talk about the contemporary campaign. Religion's playing a much bigger role in the vice presidential campaign, it seems, which is a bit of a shift from, from past presidential campaigns. Both Joe Biden and Paul Ryan are Catholics. Um, and as the, the, the adjudicator for the president, vice presidential debate acknowledged, it's the first time in American history that they had two Catholics in a forum like that. So it's quite an important moment. And took that opportunity to ask them about their personal faith and how it affected their politics. Um, for both of them, and I thought this was really interesting, both of them were arguing for the protection of religious freedom, but for different units within society. So Biden was arguing 
he said you can't enforce your personal beliefs on others. You have to protect, you have to allow women to have the right to choose. This, the, the issue is abortion, of course, because it's always abortion. If, if, if it's not abortion, it's gay marriage. Anyway, um, you can't enforce your personal beliefs through the laws on other citizens. Women should have the right to choose and should have control over their own bodies. Ryan said you can't force religious institutions to abide by laws that go against their values and beliefs. Obamacare, he argued, was infringes on the rights of Catholic hospitals and charities by forcing them to at least inform patients about abortion, ab abortion as an option. So religion is quite significant for the vice presidents. Where the presidents are concerned, nah, it's a little bit hazy. They haven't talked about it as much. And that's partially because of the questionable religious heritage for both presidents. In Obama's case, this is a little bit bizarre because he's on multiple occasions talked about the fact that he's a Christian. There's a book out that talks about the faith of Barack Obama where it talks about his Christi Christianity and how committed he is as a Christian and how that informed his career as a social organiser. And yet 17% of registered voters think he's a Muslim. <laughs> it could also have something to do with his affiliation with Jeremiah Wright, which is quite, quite controversial, but that was, uh, that was 2008 and he's long since left that. And anyway, for Obama, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a dangerous area, so he's leaving well alone. For Romney, he's a Mormon, and while this seems to be less of a problem in 2012 than it was when he ran for the Republican nomination in 2008... It's still not a widely understood religion by most Americans. So again, for him, this is kind of a... He'll talk about it in quite general terms, which he did during his nomination acceptance speech, but won't talk explicitly about some of the, 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 the doctrines of, of Mormonism. And I love that picture. I don't know if you know the, the Book of Mormon, the musical. Can't you just see Mitt Romney singing an I believe? Anyway, I digress. So this is just a couple of quick examples from the, their nomination acceptance speeches. Romney's really quite obvious in his use of religious language. You know, protecting this, the sanctity of life, uh, the, the strength and power of goodness of America comes from the strength and power of goodness of our communities, our families, our faiths, family values, emphasis on faith communities. Um, protecting the sanctity of life, honouring the institution of marriage, those two single issue things for single-issue voters, which are usually conservative Christians, um, abortion and gay marriage, um, and guarantee America's first liberty, the freedom of religion. Again, there's this... Relig religion is important, but so is the freedom of religion. Uh, and then they, they often frequently refer to being the rights endowed by our Creator... This is the interesting thing about the Constitution as well. We are all created equal. It implies that someone created people. For Obama, again, he's talking about being endowed with our Creator. So it's, it, and it's not just referring to the Creator, but referring to these sacred documents within the civil religion and drawing on these shared myths, these shared narratives referring to Lincoln, a past martyr, past prophet of the nation. And he also refers to scripture. Aaron, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so what are, what are our main points? Religious language in US presidential politics is quite obvious and explicit, but a lot is also implied. It's, it's subtle. Um, founding myths and the narratives told about the US nation are important for understanding how religion features in this rhetoric and the social, and the social historical context as well. Um, it also helps to have a bit of knowledge about the Judeo-Christian tradition because it seems to be there as a bit of an undercurrent. It's not just Republicans who make use of religious rhetoric, although that seems to be a common assumption. And even the idea that Democrats have... have started to use religion is not new because both FDR and JFK were Democrats. It's not as simple as saying America is a Christian nation either, but that it is a nation with a complex civil religion founded on freedom of conscience. But it just happens to be quite heavily influenced by the Judeo-Christian tradition. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, uh, thank you, Sam and Aram. Um, I think we've had a, a somewhat detailed <laughs> and a largely historical perspective on the role of religion in politics with some uh, meta-narratives woven in. Um, I think it's best to open the floor for some questions, but I'd, I'd first like to ask the room that is you uh, a question. And you can answer by either standing up or sitting down, uh, staying seated. Um, if you believe that it would be possible for a self-proclaimed atheist to win the presidential elections, please stand up. Okay. Thank uh, in the near future. So, let, let's say that Obama, of course, there are a lot of other aspects that are important here, but let's say that Obama would state that he's an atheist. If that, if that changes your viewpoint. Either way, it, clearly, the, the larger part here believes that um, religion is extremely important and uh, you should at least include it, uh, probably Christian perspective, if I may, if you want to run for president. Um, do, do we have any questions from the room? Please raise your hand and please wait until you have the microphone as the entire session is recorded. So, um, in, <laughs> um, in um, our soci sociology um, classes, we touched upon the subject of um, that healthcare and such is very important for the richest uh, meaning in the United States. And um, our teachers speculated that if healthcare became a more uh, a political thing in the United States, uh, possibly the uh, richest factor uh, would disappear in that sense. And you also touched on that, that um, it is taken away from the churches. Do you think that with Obamacare and such, Christianity will um, lose power and become uh, less influential? <laughs> Tag team. Um, <coughs> In the present, in the present uh, election campaign, uh, Obamacare, as as Aaron had mentioned, has has been a political dilemma because um, it's been interpreted as forcing uh, religious affiliated hospitals um, to speak about abortion when they don't want to. Um, so it. Insofar as it's interpreted as a reduction of religious freedom, and not just that, it's on the ballot in a couple of states, including Florida, where I vote, um, to repeal, to make it impossible for employers uh, to force people to have insurance. Um, I would say that the issue has become has, has acquired a religious tent to it because that is seen as politically uh, uh, useful. Um, that's a short way of saying, uh, I think for the most part with the atheist president question, religion of some form is there to stay in the United States. Um, and as a result, uh, political questions are often interpreted to play out in one way or another religiously. So the short answer is no, I don't think that Obamacare in the, sh in the near term is, is, going to, is going to diminish the influence of religion in politics uh, and society in the United States. To the, uh, to the contrary, what it's doing recently is creating a religious reaction. How politically important that religious reaction is yet to, to be seen, depending on how central religion is to people's be voting behavior. You have a follow-up question? Yeah, um, um, yeah th there's a problem with the microphone. He's, he's getting the batteries downstairs. But if you speak very loudly, then we'll... Um, but on the long term, if mm -hmm. um, healthcare goes through... 
Mm -hmm. would America become more secular because they have less reason to go to the church and uh, have the um, help from the church? Mm -hmm. That was his. Uh, that was our teacher's thesis that right. it was possible that the United States would become more secular if they have more social services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. That's a, that's a thesis. I, I would say it's in the short term. It's it's difficult to 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 come up with that conclusion. Um, in the long term, perhaps. I mean, the general trend. If you if you look at there's a, so, a sociologist, political science, Robert Putnam, who's written some some very important um, pieces in the last couple of years. One of them entitled "Bowling Alone," which came out in the late 1990s, um, which suggested a a trend in American society that that people didn't go out together, didn't belong to clubs, belonged less and less to churches. Um, there's an individualization also of belief, and that has a long-term effect on social capital and things like churches and charitable organizations. Um, ironically, that might not reduce people's belief, but it might reduce their involvement. Now the question I would then throw back is what constitutes secularization? Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, is it just public or is it also private? I think the, the other aspect to that is how do people practice their faith? So if people might not be going to church, but they might be finding religious community through other avenues. The rise of social media is having an impact on how people, people participate in, in religious rituals and religious communities. So mm. I don't know. There's a, there's, it, as Sam said, it's an idea. But there's lots of other factors to take. It's not just about health care, I think. Mm -hmm. And batteries were or were not included. That, that, that's a yes. So pl please raise your hand if, if you have a question. During the lectures, it was pointed out that um, both Democratic and Republican presidents use, use religion as um, well, a motivator for people and... Oh, and also to score votes, but um, it seems like in the last two decades the Republicans managed to um, to, to secure uh, most part of the religious right vote. How did they manage to do that, and how did the, the, did the, the Democratic Party get let them get away with that? Well, that was the slide I skipped. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can come back. Basically, um, through some dissatisfaction with what was regarded as a retreating of faith in the public sphere. Um, uh, the churches, and particularly evangelical churches, um, decided to take things into their own hands in the 1970s uh, primarily. Uh, that's it. Um, yep. And uh, the, the cultural changes, um, the rise of the big welfare state, and the court decisions that uh, went against prayer in schools and uh, also the court, Roe v. Wade in 1973, um, permitting abortion, so forth. All of these things were regarded by certain Christians as unacceptable and decided to appeal to this myth that, that Christianity was unified at the beginning of the American Republic. And as Jerry Falwell, the founder of the Moral Majority, put it, we're going to take back America. Um, so he, he founded a movement, the Moral Majority, um, and uh, Pat Robertson, a prominent evangelical uh, televangelist, um, made the suggestion that separation of church and stick, uh, state is actually a liberal, liberal anti-Christian ploy to keep God out of public life. Interesting reinterpretation, because the founders saw it as an advantage to religion. What happened was there were the three uh, signal successes, West Virginia and Kanawha Valley. Um, some parents complained about some books that they didn't like their kids reading in school, raised a big raucous. The, the, the miners also went on strike. And so the Republican, secular Republican Party noticed this. Hey, look what they're achieving at the grassroots level. They, could, they had a commission from then on to pick school books in Kanawha, West Virginia. In Dade County, uh, Florida, there was a proposal on the ballot um, to uh, ban discrimination against homosexuals. Anita Bryant, former Miss Oklahoma and pop singer, um, galvanized a lot of people with her disc jockey husband in Miami um, to 
opposed that, and it was defeated. And then there was the Equal Rights Amendment in the 70s, which was also defeated um, by people opposed to feminism. And the secular conservatives observed all this and said, hey, we have an opportunity here. We can mobilize them politically and win votes. And so they did that with the Christian Coalition, which is the next slide. And uh, what happened was um, they, they mobilized people and effectively the party, the Democratic South, which would have never voted for the Republican Party, which is the party of Lincoln, who defeated them in the Civil War, suddenly transformed to Republicans, practically overnight, after dissatisfaction with Jimmy Carter, who was the first born-again president, but you know, met with the wrong people and supported the wrong causes. So all of these factors galvanized and made an opportunity for, for the Republican Party to seize a segment of the voting population, mostly in the Deep South in the Midwest. And that's what we, if you click again, that's what ended up creating the red state, blue state phenomenon. Um, you can see the red states are the states that go for the Republicans, the blue states, the ones for the um, Democrats. And uh, Clinton was the only one in 1996 there who seemed to make some inroads um, in the South once the shift after Carter in 76 had changed. So the argument is that, that basically the Republican Party uh, strategists um, had some allies in the evangelical movement to uh, galvanize and mobilize people. And why the Democrats let them get away with it, I think... <laughs> And Sam, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think partially because the religious left were not terribly mobilised, or at least were not as vocal as the religious mm. right. And the Democrats, as a result, just wanted... Because the religious right was so powerful and so polarising, Democrats just wanted nothing to do with religion. They wanted to be really clearly mm. distinct in that way. And it's only recently with authors like Jim Wallace, who are talking about God's politics, that the, the religious left has started to make its voice more heard mm. in American politics, that the Democrats have sort of said, maybe, maybe we can make, get some mileage out of this as well. Yeah. The, the challenge for the religious left is, is its narrative is more nuanced yeah. and complicated yeah. and therefore less uh, yeah, feasible to, to communicate easily to a population during, during a campaign. Mm. <clears throat> Any more questions? One, one in the middle there. Uh, and before the microphone reaches that man, I, I have a question myself. P please raise your hand again for the... Yes. Um, I have a question to myself. We, we spent some time talking on, uh, or rather you spent some time talking about the role of religion in politics. Uh, the larger part of the presentation was about that. What if we flip that around? What about politics and religion? Mm. Would it be possible for a minister or a priest or a reverend to, to talk about politics? Say he would rant about abortion and then say, well, we, we all know who who has the strongest view on this issue. Would, would you see that happen in the US? Absolutely, yeah. There's definitely religious leaders who do that. I mean, Billy Graham came out recently endorsing Mitt Romney. Um, so it, absolutely, it happens. And Catholic priests will encourage their congregations not to vote for the Democratic candidate because the Democratic candidate will support the right to abortion. Mm -hmm. um, it, de it depends a lot on the, the priorities of the religion of, of the particular congregation as well. If it's a congregation that's particularly focused on social justice and human rights, then it's more likely that the, a, it's more likely the minister may not even say anything, but will just encourage people to vote, not necessarily mm. vote for anyone in particular, but may encourage them to vote for the more progressive of the two candidates. If it's a particularly conservative congregation, then it's more likely that the minister or the, the priest will come out and say, vote for the conservative candidate. Mm. And this is a widely accepted practice? I don't know about widely accepted. It happens. Mm. But, yeah. I'd yeah. It, it happens, but I think it depends a lot on the church. Mm. Um, for instance... You know, Pat Robertson, who's, who's a Baptist, um, he tried to win the Republican primary, I think it was 1988, wasn't it? And since then, he's not had a position officially in the church because it's not considered appropriate. Um, so, you know, the, 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 
there's no consistent line on it. Some, mm -hmm. some, have, uh, some ministers have said, okay, we're blatantly political, and others have found that their churches don't accept that. I think it's often been more subtle. Yeah, and it depends <laughs> on where you draw the line between religion and politics and the public and the private. Where, what place does religion have or should it have in public life? And there are a wide variety of views on that, and I think that will influence what a religious leader says and does on these issues. Um, could you give your opinion, please, about uh, Americans' uh, political agenda in the Middle East regarding religion, regarding the people's religion beliefs in America, since I've been told you from Florida, I'm quite curious about how the people mm. view their uh, activities. That's a, that's, a, that's a big and interesting question. Um, and, and it's evolved. Uh, because uh, the, the, certainly the Jewish vote um, is very important. Uh, and the Jewish vote tends to be solidly, regardless of whether people are conservative or liberal, tends to support Israel. Um, I spent some time studying in California and was surprised that you know the support for Israel re across the political spectrum among Jews was was there, um, but uh, there have been obviously uh, it, it tends to be something that is more strongly a feature in the Republican platform, uh, a sort of uh, an almost uncritical defense of Israel. Um, whereas it's opened up, there's been a little bit more debate in the Democratic Party about it, but it's seen by virtually everyone to be a, a dangerous thing to, to open up uh, because uh, of the alliance. I mean, I, th I think most Americans would, would regard Israel um, uh, as, as an ally in, in a difficult part of the world, but not always an ally that is um, easy to work with. But as one of my former roommates, who's a, a politico from Southern California and also Jewish, said, you know, it's, it's the only democracy there. And that's the way a lot of people feel about it. What the Arab Spring brings will be very interesting for all of them. And I think, I think that's a really important point as well, because it's... You, th you have to think about the American civil religion as well, and freedom of religion is foundational in that, which is tied to democracy. So I think in terms of the religious, what religious people want in the Middle East, would, I would say would be first the advance of democracy, but a particular type of democracy that is open to religious freedom and to expressions of religion in public life. And if you're interested in the subject, there's a nice uh, article and book by uh, a man called Stephen Wald and John Mersheimer on the Jewish lobby uh, and the importance of the Jewish lobby during the American elections. It, it sounds a bit like conspiracy theory-like, but these are respected scholars discussing uh, the Jewish lobby. So, just so you know. Any other questions? Please raise your hand. Ah, oh, the lady first in the back. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, um, to what extent do you think that the notion of change has has had uh, religious components during the uh, Obama campaign uh, campaign mm. of uh, 2008. Mm. Well, I mean, the Obama campaign brought out a, a book called Change We Can Believe In. So I think, and and interestingly, one of my best friends it lives in uh, West Virginia, and and she said there was a Facebook discussion the day of Obama's inauguration and people were complaining about, oh, all these crowds down in D.C. for the inauguration of Jesus. Uh, so I think it, there was a big part in that, N not just change, but hope. People were so disillusioned with George Bush and so disillusioned with the, the seemingly unnecessary war. I think change did take on religious dimensions. It was a, a shift. It was a, a paradigmatic shift in the way American politics... It, it was a, a step towards a new future for the American nation. And I think that that's also coming around to bite Barack Obama now, in that he hasn't... 
there was no I mean, there, was, there was no way he could there was no way he could live up to the expectations mm. that were placed on him at that time he was he was bound, there was bound to be something purely because of the nature of politics some way in which he wasn't able to do everything that he wanted to do at that point and i think because change had become such a deep commitment for people and and this hope they haven't seen as much change as they wanted and so they're they're much more disillusioned now i think um we'll have um two more questions okay first uh, yes um i wanted to ask a question about controversial religious affiliation in politics um the Protestant majority in the U.S. was mentioned, and that was a big deal for JFK's election, who was a Catholic, yet he won. Mm -hmm. And um, B Barack Obama was mentioned, him being accused of being a Muslim, yet he won. Uh, Mitt Romney, he's a Mormon, a minority religion, and yet he has a real chance of winning. And you also mentioned the power of the Jewish lobby, and yet mm -hmm. despite that, and even today, it seems nigh unthinkable of having a Jewish president. Why do you think that is? Might have been a Jewish vice president uh, if Gore had won in 2000. Mm -hmm. um, I think really the, there's been an evolution in, in the acceptance of, of uh, the variety of religion in the United States uh, since really the, the, the 1950s. Uh, from the 60s onwards, uh, there's, there's been a broadening. It's ironic because the picture we get from, from the outside, and particularly we look at the rise of the religious right and the dominance of the religious right's um, rhetoric within the Republican Party, one assumes that that's the way it is. But on the, on the other hand, the Democratic Party has seen a broadening of its coalition um, since it's left the South, <laughs> effectively, um, it's, it's taken in uh, swatches of the West Coast and the East Coast um, and other bits as well that have been much more ethnically and religiously diverse. Um, and so as a result, the Democratic electorate um, has, has been broadening its appreciation of the variety of acceptable religion, as it were. And fascinatingly, I mean, uh, the Immigration Act in... in, in the 80s and 90s immigration acts, there's been a huge influx of immigration in the United States. Um, the immigrant population has sort of doubled in the last 20 years from, from Latin America. And it's possible that by 2050, the, there, there will be the majority of people born in the United States, newborn in the United States, will be from Latin American descent. That's going to change religious understanding in the United States as well, plus the influx of, of Asian immigrants. Um, so all of this is changing the appreciation and the politics of religion in the United States. And I think that transformation has been underway since, since the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, really. Um, so I think, you know, the fact that Mormonism might be acceptable in a president is, is a function of that. Mm. Thank you. Okay, final question. Uh, how tolerant are Americans towards Muslims or other non-Western uh, religions? That's a very big final question. <laughs> hmm. In my experience, it depends a bit on the American. I, I don't yeah. know the um, I don't know the stats, um, but interestingly enough, I mean, I think a lot of 9-11 was a wake-up call to the United States about the outside world that, you know, most Americans don't have passports. And it's, there's, there's a lot of... My, my father-in-law, who's Dutch, says that the Netherlands has a lot of buitenland. Well, the United States has a lot of binnenland, and so do lots of large countries. And as a consequence, the media focus isn't really to the outside as often as perhaps it should be. Um, so I think it was more ignorance than intolerance for a long time. And there was a real surprise that the rest of the world or some people in the rest of the world might not like us. And that has resulted in a, a decade of fairly intense 
study now to find out the geography of Iraq and Afghanistan and to find out enough to talk about Islam. But there's a long way to go. Mm. <laughs> but would someone have a problem with uh, having a Muslim for a neighbor? Would it be sensitive? Would it be different from having an, a Christian neighbor? Yeah. I think it depends on the neighborhood. I, I think it depends on the neighborhood, but I, I have to say, um, uh, just a man on the street, just my own personal view is, I, I, I find Americans generally uh, more tolerant on, racial, on, on religious differences than on racial differences. Mm. Sometimes they go together, and that creates part of the issue. Uh, that complicates, but but uh, I think uh, you know people who uh, who are faithful and good citizens um, are respected generally, mm. regardless of their beliefs. Which um, which again uh, comes back to this idea of the importance of the civil religion. Yeah. If yeah. if a person is a good citizen and upholds the principles of democracy and particularly U.S. democracy, then in a sense their religion doesn't matter. Mm. Mm. It might matter for the presidency, but uh, yeah. it's, it's a long time before that will come. Yeah. But, but uh, on the street uh, and in society, I think, I would say it's a fairly tolerant action, mm -hmm. even uh, now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, we've allowed for uh, five extra minutes, and I think we should stop here. Uh, I have um, a few final remarks to make. If, if you're interested in the, let's say, the wider debate of religion and secularism, I'd like to point you to a book which was published uh, with Palgrave Macmillan, which in itself sh could be a reason to buy the book because it's a very, very um, a highly respected publisher. Uh, the title is After Secularism, Rethinking Religion in Global Politics, and it was written by Erin Wilson. And no, she, she, she's been living in the Netherlands for quite some time now, so you know the Dutch, more or less. <laughs> There's a 30% discount. So no matter the, the original price tag, there's a discount, so we should buy the book. That's how it works, right? Now, somewhere during your presentation, Aaron said, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a service. Um, that, that indeed would be a reasonable question to ask a largely Dutch audience. Uh, however, we, we do do religion, but in a different way. And um, we have a small token of appreciation. Ah, you put it over there. Um, some of you can probably already guess the title, right? If we do religion, uh, it's literature. So uh, the book is by Harry Mulisch, and it's called Discovery of Heaven. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.